What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Pot Scum. You looked for it and you found it. The podcast where we dive into the deepest, darkest, murkiest waters with a plethora of legendary guests. And who better to talk to legends than one himself? That's right. You're looking at him. The number one scumbag, your bastard of ceremonies, Rex Ruger. That's Rex with three X's. Don't get it twisted. You might also know me as the man with the golden voice and the velvet tongue, ladies, a.k.a. the king of sleaze, a.k.a. the hair metal high priest, and most importantly, a.k.a. Diamond David Lee Roth Jr. And we're almost at the finish line with that DNA testing. So we will know once and for all, conclusively, indefinitively, that I am the son of glam, the front man for the band. Just smoked a few grams, got a million fans. I'm your ice cream man, Mr. Wap Bop, Loo Bop, Wap Bam Bam, Hot Damn, Shazam. And of course, if you're looking at this beautiful head of hair and you're wondering, Rex, how do I look amazing like you? Whoom. You want the locks that rock? Go out there and get you some and do your thing. Let me give myself a look before our guest comes in. As always, I'm coming to you from the Pink Pussycat Lounge, a.k.a. the Den of Sin. Joined, as always, by my silent partner back there, Mr. Keith Hernandez, Jr. Hmm, looking good. No need to even freak out. Today, we got a good guest for you. A guy that I'm excited about. Very excited about. Glad to have him on Pod Scum. Got a lot to ask him about. And uh, I'm pumped. I'm fucking pumped. I'm going to say it. Not even going to fly into my diatribe about all my different bands. Although, if you want to play with Love Sword, hit me up in the comment section. Send your auditions. If you want to be part of the backing band and stare at the backside of the second greatest frontman to ever do it, hit me up. Because I am looking for virtuoso players to play with me. An exclusive opportunity to be in Love Sword. Fronted by the great Rex Ruger. Need I say more? This is, of course, the No Frills podcast. Why no frills? Why no frills? Why don't I get an intro song? Why don't I get animation? Why don't you have any bells and whistles? No frills. Because you get thrills. And you're looking at them. Ta-da! Thrills. So while we wait for our guest here, I will... Uh, let you guys know that uh, today's guest a little bit of a different departure. I know we usually see a lot of headbangers on here. Well, I guess this guy's probably uh, could fall into that category. Um, certainly looks the part, but uh, no, this is an accomplished guy. This is a you know, this is a guy that shouldn't even be giving me the time of day. Wait a minute now, should I really be saying that though? I mean, I am after all, David Lee Roth Jr. Maybe he's the lucky one that I'm granting him some of my precious time. No, all kidding aside, it's a huge honor to have this guy, man. And uh, here he is right now, ringing my doorbell. Ding dong! Let's bring him on in. Should have got my beforehand, but eh, what do you get? You live and you learn, right? You live and you learn. Da, 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 da. Hey, oh. there he is. I always love looking at another good-looking, long-haired, blonde guy. There's so few of us left. You know what I mean, buddy? <laughs> Not a lot of us floating around out there, you know? That's funny, man. Hey, I'm, a, I'm trying to get my uh, earphones set up here. Oh, right? you do your thing, man. Do your thing. You know what? I'm almost 50 years old. I don't edit anything, man. I'm pretty new at the podcasting thing myself, man. But, uh, you know, I just have this audacity about me that I should just go ahead and do it because, I, I you know, I am cut from the cloth of legend. I got a picture of the old man right there. See? Simon Dave Jr., you're looking at him. So I assume this is probably an honor for you. This is all, yeah, I, you're not a guy into tech. I can see you and hear you great, buddy. Uh, okay, can you? Is that cool? I guess perfect. I don't even need these. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, are you impressed that you're talking to David Lee Roth Jr., or does that not even impress a guy like you? You've worked with all the biggies, right? I, I know <laughs> I know a couple of them, but I will say Sammy <laughs> Hagar gave me a – an award once in 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 the in London, and we walked up there, and he he looked at us and he goes, "I don't know who the fuck you guys are, but this is yours." <laughs> <laughs> See, now my father wouldn't have done that, man. He would have treated you with the respect that you deserve. And and, and as soon as that DNA testing comes through, man, and I start to see a little bit of that 1984 and Panama money, 
I'm yeah. going to really, I'm going to give this podcast a serious upgrade, buddy. And then, and then it's off to the moon. I'm telling it's you, man. It's coming. It's six Just waiting for you. Away. This is, of course, for people that ha have lived under a rock. Jaron Johnston from uh, the great, legendary, I'm going to say legendary, Cadillac 3. I know you don't want to toot your own horn, so I'm more than happy when my guests come on to toot it for them, though. But you've worked with some, you've worked with some big stars. But I want to ask you, though. You, you've written a lot of great songs, people like Tim McGraw. Uh, I don't know. Give me the list. I got a couple of uh, Keith Urban. I mean, some real heavyweights in the in the country uh, industry. Do you like performing more or do you like being a behind the scenes guy writing more? Um, well, if I didn't like performing, I, I don't think we'd be out here because it's a lot easier to not do this shit. <laughs> sure, he, I, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, and that's the, I think that's the cool thing about the position that, you know, the three of us are in. It's like we all have these kind of cool other lives right and so you don't have to commit to one thing all the time it's just like you can kind of dabble and you know you can you know i have a lot of different passions man i i'm i'm one of those guys that's just constantly trying to be creative and i get bored and so it's pretty right. cool to have a couple different things to go you know right 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 now i I will say before I forget and 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 we, and we get get talking we wrap this thing up. I want to wish you a happy birthday beforehand because I know you have one coming up, don't you? October fourth. Yeah, yeah, Tuesday. yeah. Tuesday. Now, 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 when I hit forty years old, for me personally, and and, and I know you're going to be, uh, you're already past uh, forty, but do, do do birthdays carry any weight with you anymore? Do they bother you? Does does aging at all uh, affect you at all? Or not? yeah, how do you approach birthdays? Just another day. My wife had to remind me. I booked all this stuff with. I, nice. got her, I write a song and everything. She goes, your birthday's Tuesday. You know that? And I go, oh, yeah. shit. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know how it is, man. It's like at that point, you're just kind of like, I look forward to it. It's another reason to get drunk, you know? Yeah, 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 <laughs> like, yeah. Here yeah, we yeah. go again. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, is life on the road still like one big party, though? Like as you get older, do you still like to hit it just as hard? No, man. You know, I've got a five-year-old at the doctor right now with my wife in town, and I'm in Columbus, Ohio. So it's you know it's constantly balancing things you know yeah we still drink and we still you know party a little bit but like yeah. it's you got to get up and get going man you know yeah. too much too much stuff going on i work a day job and it's just too hard to it's just, it's just too hard to be hung over man i do i you know i, I and my audience knows i love my smoke i always yeah. love my smoke but uh yeah as far as drinking it's been quite a long time but uh, before we get into the music stuff I want to first, as long as you're cool with talking about it, because I think it's very important. You know, uh, I, I work in the healthcare industry by day. I'm a nurse, uh, believe it or not. I take the hair off. I leave it home and uh, I actually go take care of people. Now, uh, uh, so it is very personal to me, too. But you, but you lost your father in 2022 to COVID and you've been pretty outspoken about getting vaccinated. Um, yeah. uh, talk to me a little bit about like you know, what you saw your father go through and how that affected you, because I think it's important for people to hear that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um you know, it's still pretty painful. You know, it's, it's like if going through that whole thing, we go through it every day still. And it happened really quickly. Sure. And he, he was very, um, you know, not to speak weird about it, but it's like, it's the truth. He was pretty stubborn to the vaccination and to the fact where he, you know, just, he was, he was prime target, you know, like sure. 65 years old, a bit overweight, high blood pressure, all this stuff. Right. Yeah. And so it's like, I told him, I was like, dad, this shit, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not gonna, you know, I don't care how strong you are, or how much you believe in whatever you believe in, right, you know, right, it, right. this thing, this thing is real. And I've, I've been seeing it cause I've been all over the world and I'm telling you, man, and you know, it, it, it hit him, took him down in two weeks, man. And, and I mean, took him down, killed him, you know, yeah. and it's, yeah. it, it's, you know, for me, it's like, it became a, you know, for obvious reasons. Sure. You know, um, a standpoint to really get behind because um, it, you know, my my life, my son's life, my wife's life, my mom's life, my sister's life will never Absolutely. be the same. Absolutely. And so it's a big hole. It's a big hole. And so I, you know, what, the reason I even said anything, I try to stay away from politics. My dad was half the reason that I tried to avoid politics because like, all, at least from my standpoint, because I was like, I don't want people to, you know, I make music to make people feel good. I don't want people, right. you know, judging me or whatever, you know, for, for this. I want them to judge me on the, you know, the music and stuff the like that. Like, right. That's fine. And, and so I tried to stay away from it. And then that was like a step too far. And so I was like, you know, between that one and, and uh, George Floyd, uh, that's the two things that I've stood up 
to say, you know, yeah. and it, yeah. it, 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 it changed my life and it pissed me off. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, your father was uh, your father, Jerry Ray. He was a musician himself. Um, now, um, now you said he had some, uh, you know, he had some other health ailments that probably certainly didn't help uh, on the COVID side of things. But being a, mus a lifelong musician, uh, y you know, w w was his lifestyle relatively unhealthy you know, or, or did he take pretty good care of himself? Yeah, I mean, that was pretty healthy considering I'm just saying his age group and yeah, his yeah. weight and Right, you know, you get to that age and you've been eating pork chops and greens your whole life. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I do. Yeah. You're gonna get high blood pressure. That's what it is, and drink beer, yeah. and 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 that's you know, he's that Louisiana good old boy kind of thing. And right, uh, right. For the most part, he's pretty healthy, though. You know, I mean, uh, I wouldn't say tip top shape, but he, you yeah. know, it was, yeah. <laughs> it, it was, you know, like I said, man, he it took him down in two weeks. So whatever you make of that, you know, it's just yeah. It's so no people, li people listening out there, go out and get your vaccinations and your boosters. You know, I mean, I'll say it for you because you don't want to get on the political side of things. And I respect that, too. Do you think sometimes that uh, uh, that, you know, that, that sometimes musicians have a tendency to drag too much of their politics and their own views into their music? And do you like when they use that format in, in order to do things like that? Or do you think, you know, because I, I really love what you just said just there about making music to make people feel good and not dragging the semantics and all that kind of stuff into it. Is that important to you? Is, is music really about just just the, when you strip it right down, just about having fun and, and, and forgetting about life for a while. If you have a message, man, that if you're raging against the machine, go. I get right, it. You know right. what? Because that message drives that music, right? Right. If you're Dixie Chicks and you believe in what you're saying and you're, right. you're, you're practicing what you're preaching and all that shit, go. Right. Go. My right. thing is, it's like if I'm out here singing about trucks and dogs and girls and uh, drinking, yeah. my, my standpoint, unless I write a song particularly for that message, I don't right. really have any business to, you know what I mean? Like, right, right, whatever, right. whatever, my my standpoint, dude, I just, I believe what I believe. You believe what you believe. That's, sure. you know, that's the world we live in. And I, I respect you. Even if I don't agree, me and my dad didn't agree for three years, man. You know? The last, Mine too. <laughs> yeah, me, the last three, four years of my dad's life, we didn't agree, man. And yeah. so it, yeah. it affected our lives, but we still could fucking talk to each other you know what i mean so right. sure. Uh, sure i you know i i, I don't want to put my thing on anybody but like i said if you're rage against the machine go it's a, it's a piece of movement let's go you know that's what fuels like, the fire that's what fuels their fire exactly so now you've written now uh uh, uh for other artists nine number ones is what i have down here you've been uh, you've been excuse me nominated for multiple grammys by the way when the fuck are we going to give you a goddamn grammy already come on jesus christ what's uh, the hold up here not this year <laughs> Not just. <laughs> I thought I thought I might sneak in there with the Tabasco with Sweet Tea record, but we just didn't make it. <laughs> well, listen, I am so glad you brought that record up because I was just bumping it downstairs, and I'll tell you what. And I don't know if this is intentional or not, but you know, I know that you guys do a, a brilliant job of towing that line, and not a lot of people I, I don't think have found success in doing it quite the way you guys do with towing that line between. Uh, uh, showcasing your country and influences along with your rock and alternative influences. But uh, especially with Tabasco and Sweet Tea, I'm really noticing some elements of a lot of funk in there, uh, particularly uh, some uh, Road Soda, Sweet Southern Spirit, the title track, Devil's Lettuce. A lot of them have a real, you know, a like a funky kind of a flavor to them where they kind of really get you, you know what I mean? Like, uh, is is that intentional? I mean, can can you speak on the influence of 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 in, infusing funk in there? Yeah, um, the whole thing came. You know, we kind of started that record uh, on the bus just as fun. I just kind of started messing around. I was listening to a lot of John Schofield, listened to a lot of Madusky Martin Wood stuff that I listened to early on. You know, I was like nineteen, and I kind of got back into that stuff. And uh, I was like trying to, and you hear a little bit of that influence on the end like in parts of the country fuzz record because the last couple songs we recorded for country fuzz was like the jam blue el camino i was really into back into zz top and um so i started kind of going down this little wormhole and then i was like man what if this whole thing i, I kept thinking i was like man we've never really made a cohesive record that was all one thing you right. know right and and i was like what if the whole thing and i really got to hone in on on that thought when COVID shut everything down, I moved out of the beach um, with my wife and kid and, and it just started being like, dude, let's just make everything go into each different one. I was like, what sure. if the whole, what if the whole record is this like hillbilly funk DJ set? And originally we, we were, the thought was, I called our manager and said, 
and I called Neil, our drummer. I was like, "Why? Why can't we just put this on iTunes or whatever for a dollar twenty nine? Whatever it is, you pay for one song, mm-hmm. and it's Tabasco and Sweet Tea, but you get the whole record. You get thirty three minutes of of a jam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and yeah. so we just and that was the original idea, and we could not because of the DSPs and the uh, the way that Apple and iTunes does their format you we yeah. couldn't figure out how to do it so yeah. they said the less the label said the, the least we can sell it for is 3.99 and i said okay 3.99 because at, at that time everybody's sitting around on the couch sad drinking i know, you know? i was I like know. let's give them something to smile about and sure. that was what I that was it. what that whole record was man and, and it's yeah. and and the funk influence though yeah man it was a lot of tower power you know dad was really into tower power and yeah he got me into you know um i mean literally those it was like drop the slot uh back to oakland i think is one and like all these great records and yeah and they were record they were actually records you know sure you yeah <laughs> yeah he's old school it over yeah <laughs> yeah the old and days so, there's probably a lot of kids right now that'll be listening to scratching their heads like what yeah. <laughs> flipping Very it confused. over <laughs> but we, we put jude our kid our five-year-old man he's got jack white's little uh they sent us over a record player yeah. to get when he was born and, it, and he just every day, man. It's it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, yeah, 10, 11, yeah. 12. yeah, 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 yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, uh, it's great, man. But yeah, well, are you finding it right now, though, uh, in today's landscape of the music business? And I talk to a lot of musicians on here, uh, some rock, some metal. Um, a very daunting road, though, nowadays in terms of you know being able to make money, achieve commercial success, and. It, and I know, and, and I know, most artists certainly will say that they're in it, and and for the love of it, obviously. Um, but you are also out there trying to make a living. Is it frustrating right now being a musician? And how do you stay motivated? How do you keep the other guys in the band? Uh, you know, uh, 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 Kelby and uh, uh, Neil. You know, I did. You guys ever just want to throw up your hands and just say, "Fuck it, what are we doing?" You know, what I mean, like, I mean, is there a frustration sense to it? There is. I mean, it, we're in a very cool situation to where we all have you know kind of the means to live because we have done other things right sure. right um we're in we're in a place where we have a record deal where they're uh, there it's more of a partner we just make records we take them to scott Rochetta and say hey here it is and he puts it out they do their thing we do our thing nobody's like pressuring us to Okay. Right, that hit single, which a right. lot of artists are in that world of being like, "Shit, this do we have the one?" Like I our know. thing, is, well, you know, like tonight we'll sell this. This I think it's already sold out. We'll sell out. We sell tickets because we've been we've hit the ground. Over, you know, and, and, and it's worldwide now at this point too. So it's like we're not. There's not that stress of like, oh gosh, are we gonna make it? Like right. we're, we're doing great. We got buses and we got families right. and right. everybody's great. And so I think. But yes, to answer your question, there is always that, you know, like you mentioned the Grammy thing earlier, like there, there's always that thing in the back of your mind is like, how do we make this bigger? And so right. every time you go in, into a record situation, like in my headspace, I'm like, how can we change? I'm not necessarily trying to make it bigger. I'm like, how can we, you know, change the game? How can right. we, right. how can we compete at a higher level and how can we keep our fans on their toes and right. so and, and also keep me and kelby and neil creatively stimulated you know what i sure. mean like where right. we enjoy going out and playing this shit every night and i'll tell you right now man the three or four funk songs that we play at the set the tabasco stuff every night we're like yeah vibing on it yeah vibing on it feel yeah feeling yeah. it that's yeah i know that's great and and and, and you know it, it's, it's great when the when the, when the fun still exists for you guys too obviously i'd have to imagine you know i mean well and a lot of bands man are put together the three of us right. grew up together you know what i mean we grew up together in, in nashville right well you got frozen for a minute there buddy you there Oh, did we lose him? I'm still on, but he seems to be frozen. Let's see.
Let's see if we can get him back in here. Hold tight there. We're uh, speaking with Jaron Johnston here, who just froze on us. And see, this is what not having a technical advisor does for your show. As you can see, I have a frozen Jaron Johnston right here. But he will be back, folks. We'll get him back in. We'll get him back in. Now you can just listen to me for a second. Hopefully, we'll get him back in here. But in the meantime, you can just listen to Keith Hernandez drone on and on and on and on and on. Well, that went extremely well for a little while, but I know Jaron, he will be back in. We will get this thing back off the ground again in a second. So you guys can just feast your eyes on uh, me and uh, I can tell you a little bit about, uh, well, we'll talk a little bit about the, oh, there he is. All right, dude. All right, no, we got you back. There you are, buddy. That's all right. Hey, listen, man, just like I said before, I don't edit shit, man. I literally just start, uh, I'd start riffing off the top of my head. I, I being 49 years old, I'm the furthest one from knowing jack shit about technology you were literally in the middle of talking to me then all of a sudden you were frozen in this position right there and i'm just like okay i guess we lost jaron but you, usually what i do is i'll just resend the link and usually you can just like re-enter again man but you know i call it the no frills podcast because i like to hide my discrepancies in plain sight because i don't know what i'm doing i don't have any cute little intro theme or any shit that i do i just obviously, come on i don't know obviously i don't know what i'm doing and i do this right. shit all the time I do, like, I do three I, or four of these a day. <laughs> well, I mean, it's nice because at least you've got some people around you to help. I mean, like my technical advisors, like literally at this stage of my life are something's wrong with my computer or my phone. I take it to my kids. Hell, sometimes I take it to my grandkids and they're all under fucking 10. And I, it, it, even they know the technology better than I do. Uh, uh, but getting back to uh, uh, right before we got disconnected, you were speaking about uh, 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 the band and the fact that uh, 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 the link between you and the other bandmates and that you guys grew up together. Uh, uh, talk about how that plays into the band aspect of it um, in terms of the creative process. When you guys sit down and write songs, who's the creative force behind it? Is it a collaborative effort? Are you the main writer? I mean, how do you guys get together and create? It's It's different every time. I would say... Can you hear me all right? You good? Oh yeah, perfect. Yep. Um, um, it's different every time. Like I would say, if if somebody had to be named as the creative, you know, mind behind the the band, that would probably be me. Yeah. But there's things that Neil adds to the situation that cannot be replaced. There's right. things will be added to the thing that cannot be replaced. Like for an example, like we all sat in a room in Austin, Texas and wrote bury me in my boots together mm -hmm. granted it, a lot of the the lyric stuff but we all came up with that thing together right? right um and then sometimes i'll write by myself sometimes neil will write with someone else and bring us graffiti you know what i mean or, right. or like, yeah well things like that which i you know i just hear it and i'm like hell man that's great because i can't all i can't all always be like feel motivated or you know, excited to write a Cadillac song and then some things that I just wouldn't think to write. And so it's kind of fun to, to have those other aspects being brought to you. I, I think that's where, you know, a lot of bands, they get burnt out so quickly because it's all on one person. Whereas a lot of it is on me, but I have structures to lean on. You know what I mean? I have spider legs with, with the guys. Um, and also my fellow co-writers that I work with on a daily basis that are, you know, Nashville is such a great environment for that being, you know, brought up there and making all these friends that are, you know, extraordinary songwriters that you can lean on. Right. Like, and some days you'll be with like Tony Lane and Nathan Chapman and you'll be writing this thing for Tim McGraw. But then you hear it a little differently and I do a different demo and all of a sudden it's a Cadillac 3 song. Right. And that that's happened a couple of times on this new record we're working on right now. That's like, it's like, whoa, okay, that's cool. You know, I didn't right, see that. Right. I got, that's what I mean by it's different every time. Is it hard sometimes when you write a great song though? Uh, is it tough sometimes, uh, you know, like if you really, uh, you'll put something down that you think is phenomenal. 
uh, you know, to not want to keep it for yourself? Is it hard sometimes? Like the, you know, because I always hear artists, you know, referring to songs as like their children. You know, what I mean, like they're very possessive, and each one means something to them. Is it hard to write a song, uh, you know, as a songwriter and hand it over to somebody else and say, here, uh, you know, this is for you, especially if you know that it's a real banger and you'd really selfishly like to keep it for yourself. Not when you, you know, when you see the, like when it works. Yeah, when yeah, it works, man. Like, yeah, like when you hand. Keith Urban raise him up, yeah. and he Derek Church in on it, and it's a Grammy nominated, ACM nominated, CMA nominated, and the the money and all this shit. Because people usually ask me, they're like, "What's the one song you would have kept for yourself?" You know, and I'm like, usually raise him up. But then I'm like, if I did that, man, who knows if that song you talk about it being your kid, right, would have done what the kid did. You know, right. like who knows right. if I could have gotten that to where. It and there's the other side of that too, where you're like, "Well, shit, what if it did work?" And then we would be bigger. But you're like, "Man, you, you right. kind of you drive yourself you know, crazy playing devil's advocate like that, though, right?" I mean, you can't, yeah. you can't, you, you got to move on. It's a constant catch twenty two because you're, you're like, ah, whether well, it's this, it's that, ah, ah, ah. Right. And so you just make the best decision you can. And right. you know, I, I'll tell you right now, man. We, you know, we're on the that Miranda Lambert tour this past year, and. um we would write songs of Miranda and little big town and just hanging out, drinking and, you know, writing, writing songs, doing what people do that we know. It was like that very almost famous vibe. Like, right. You're on a bus and you're just writing songs. Somebody with a guitar. Oh, what's right. that? And that's cool. Yeah. You know, and yeah, thinking, yeah. Oh, Organically, you're writing, yeah. Yeah. You're writing a cool thing. And then, so now the thing is listening back to these songs, we're like, well, shit. Is that a kind of like three song? Is that a little big town song? Is that a Miranda song? Do we all do it together? Do we pitch right. it to Tip McGraw? Like these right. are literally conversations that we're having this week about it because we're working on a new record and they're both done with their records. Their right. records are out. So they're out of cycle. So now we're like, okay, are these ours? And then you're trying to listen to them. And then you're also at the same time trying to make a cohesive record, right. which is very hard when you you're doing that kind of thing you know yeah is it hard when you create with uh kelby and neil because of the family uh family connection is it hard if somebody doesn't like something or have you guys gotten to the point growing up together where you guys can be very candid and open with each other like you know like approaching if something doesn't work or critiquing each other's stuff uh you know does that dynamic ever come into play yeah i mean that, that's any any kind of thing any family organization any kind of a business brand band that's always going to be a thing but i think for the most part we're a very democratic um union so to speak yeah, we, yeah. we we work very well together because we all know what works for our band and our brand and we also know what we like and what we're it really comes down to what we're the three of us are going to want to play every night for the rest of our life and right. that's what you you really have to look at we can all love a song but when we listen to it after we get off stage and we're drinking beers and we're like the, the the truth is they, okay they, and they're usually like well jaron are you going to want to play this are you going to want to sing this and i'm like shit you know you're like, probably not <laughs> yeah <laughs> so that, that's usually how a song makes it or breaks it you know but that's pretty refreshing though like when you have that you, you, you know when you work that closely with people and, and 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 you have the the family aspect to it you know that you can be that candid and just say nah i'm probably not gonna i probably wouldn't you know i mean that's got to be pretty refreshing though rather than having like a uh you know you see so many bands you know i've interviewed so many bands on here and you look at their in their wikipedia page they've got so many it's like a running joke so many ex-members you know you can tell obviously that people just come and go and they can't get along so that's really nice that you can you know that you have a good stable lineup of people that you can trust that you can work with and that you can collaborate with i mean i think that's really the best way to make me i mean the best way to make music is if the group itself is in harmony it's the only reason that we're still out here doing it man you know it's because yeah. it, the three of us we uh, you know a we've worked so hard to get here and right. B, we all know that like the moment and not to say there hasn't been moments where we kind of all look at each other and be like all right it's december here yeah. comes another year do we want to do this again right. you know and because times get really weird and like this past year has been one of those tests, you know, and thank God I have those guys, man, because it's the hardest year of my life. Yeah. And so it's, it, it's legitimately been so tough and having this thing has been therapy and it's been something to go do and not just sit around and be pissed off at the world. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Totally get that. Um, so, um, uh, 
talk to me a little bit about, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the top of the interview, uh, how you guys are able to, uh, you know, seamlessly tell that line, you know, between certainly hearing rock elements and certainly hearing country elements. But on both sides of that, you know, who are guys that you, and I, I, I hate to, you know, influence question is always thrown out, but who are some guys who like you really, uh, you know, who really gets your attention on the rock side of things and on the country side of things who just really, you feel like really kind of shaped who you are as a musician. Um, you know, Tom, we're all big Tom Petty fans. And if the yeah. guys were, they'd be like, we all on, on three, we'd answer Tom Petty. Yeah. <laughs> Rest in peace. The late great Tom Petty. Yeah. Take yeah, it from us much so too soon the way that he did things and the way they made records, I always was very infatuated with that, you know, like the, the, yeah. gang, the gang, man, you know, it was like, yeah. it was even from them moving from Gainesville to LA is mud crutch yeah. trying to get a record deal, you know, like that yeah. whole thing that when they were bigger in the UK than they were in the States and Stan Lynch would wake up in the back of the van in Kansas City and say, right, hey, are we big here? And they'd be like, no, nope, not yet. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, yeah. our, that's pretty much been our line. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, it's a very similar thing. And then you you really look at Dave Grohl and what he's accomplished with coming from Nirvana and building the food brand and um, his songwriting and him being, I'm, I was, grew up a drummer him being a drummer and turning into a frontman, I, I kind of based my thing on that. You know, that that's what made me, me watching him made me think that's possible, right? Right, right. And, and so, you know, you can be Dave Grohl and Nirvana, but then you can become Kurt Cobain uh, in a different situation. I was like, wow, that's okay, shit. So I right. played drums my whole life, but maybe I could start writing songs. Right. So you see that thing. And, and, you know, in, in the country side of things, it's, it's interesting because there's not a lot of country that's influenced me to go against the grain, right? right. Unless you look at Bo Cephas, obviously, you know, um, if you call Leonard Skinner that, I, I do call a lot of Leonard Skinner, you know, some, some of that stuff is very country. Um, Almond Brothers, that kind of thing. Um, you know, even to the situation, if you're looking at like Garth Brooks, like, Garth Brooks showed me how big country can be. Right, right. You know, and 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 he did it his own way. You yeah. know, it, it's crazy. You know, I watched him last Tuesday night. I went to the uh, NSAI Awards. I watched him get the Lifetime Achievement Award and watched him go up and talk for an hour. I mean, the guy was crying. You know how he is. Garth is. Sure. Well-deserved. Well Well-deserved award. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, it's like when I saw him flying around in Reno when I was 12 years old, I met him at the Grand Ole Opry because dad introduced us. And just the most genuine but bigger bigger than the world situation so i was like that's a very cool thing you know what yeah, i mean so very the, yeah so I, I would say influences at least in the country thing a lot of garth a lot of you know and songwriting st style stuff tom uh, petty and garth brooks are not bad guys to emulate I, I, i'll say that much you know what and i mean if, like and if and, you and, listen and, to and, us if you listen to us it really makes sense you can hear yeah. it you can check yeah Absolutely, yeah. you can hear. That was why I asked about the funk element, though, because that was kind of like a new wrinkle in there that I really liked. Like, I found myself like saying, you know what, this is the kind of, uh, I, I told my wife, I'm like, this is kind of the, and I don't even know what I meant by this, but this is the, the, the Sweet Tabasco and Tea album is like one of those albums where you can chill and vibe and smoke, but you can also make babies to it. I mean, you know, you can do it all to it. You know what I mean? That, it's it's, that, it's partying, was, fucking all of it. It's all good. We, hey, we did it. We did it. That's we, what we were You did it. About. You, you did it. Think, it's you know, a I lot mean, of people don't know about, like, they don't know this part of about us that, like, I mean, shit, the first time I got arrested was in LaPel County, Indiana, buying, trying to drive up because you couldn't buy tickets online yet to a fish show at Deer okay. Creek. Yeah. And so, like, we were fish heads. We were following fish around. We were going to Mo shows. We were listening to Modesky Martin Wood. We were trying to figure out how to meet string cheese incident you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> it's we came up in that world too and so a lot of that came out in this record you know but you also have your your country songwriting elements in there too which was it that's why that record was so fun and it was just you know it was all done in garage band man it was like old i mean it was such a ghetto way of making a record <laughs> yeah 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 um uh, um so uh if people haven't seen you guys perform in a live setting, 
Uh, what would you tell people to expect if they were coming out to see you guys live? You know what I mean? Like, what is it that you guys uh, deliver? Because obviously right now, uh, you know, uh, uh, people coming to see bands live, buying merchandise, it's pretty much paramount to a lot of X uh, uh, success right now. I mean, a lot of bands, you know, especially with albums, not album sales, not being what they used to be. Um, people are coming out, plopping their money down. What are they getting when they come to see a Cadillac three show? Man, I think it's, um, you know, we, we're five, six records deep now. And so you're going to get everything from the beginning to the end and or to the to now. And it's it's way different than the records. I think a lot of people will say that, wow, you guys are so different live than you are on your records. And that's because we're just three guys up there, you know, that grew up together. We're basically just jamming. And <laughs> Right. trying to get through whatever and we never know what's coming next i look over and stony my guitar tape brings me a guitar and i look at the guitar it's one of two songs we have 16 guitars out with us yeah so you, you never because everything's in a different tuning and so it's 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 a it's it's a it's a roller coaster man if i could say yeah. anything it's like and it's loud and it's I, I if, if anything i would say bring some cash for the beer and bring your earplugs. <laughs> it's going to be a big party. You're going to get, you guys are going to yeah. throw down. Um, yeah. So uh, l let me ask you um, about uh, the switch, as you mentioned earlier, from drums to guitar. I'd seen an interview where, you know, everything kind of changed for you. Your father gave you the Kramer. Uh, you kind of, uh, you kind of did a flip flop from drums wow. over the guitar. Uh, yeah. What was the, homework, uh, what was the, yeah. What was the impetus? Uh, for your dad uh, doing that? Because obviously your father's a drummer. A lot of fathers love the idea of a son following in the father's footsteps. Uh, to, you know, to, to take you from a drummer and turn you onto another instrument, you, you, did you ever ask him what was his motivation you know, behind that? Why he wanted to, did, did he want you to be a front man? Did he think, you know, I, I, you deserve to be out in the front of the stage? You know, drummers get, the, drummers are the Rodney Dangerfields of the band sometimes, no respect. <laughs> I think, you know, he said it pretty clearly. I mean, this is all over the internet, but he said, you know, you can make a living playing drums, but you can really make money writing songs. And he gave yeah. me that guitar. I think I was 13. Give me two guitars, gave me the Kramer. And he gave me a, uh, a, 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 a I still have it. It's a classical gut string uh, Epiphone. And that was really hard to play because my hands were so small. And that's a wide neck guitar. Yeah. But the Kramer, and yeah. it, they had this little amp about the size of this phone that I'm talking on here, and a curly yellow cable, like the old school curly cables, and it, yep, yep. it had it had one knob, and you go all the way up, and it's distorted. You go down, and it's not. And so I was like, "Well, we got to go yeah, all the way up." Right. And, and so I'm sitting, you know, he, he he basically said, you know, that was I think that was the reason he gave me that, and I, you know, because I didn't even ask for it. He just brought it home brought them both home i think he went to a pawn shop and saw them both and got them um i don't think he had any other motive other than just being like try this too because i was pretty quick at picking up the drums i could pretty much play anything you set in front of me because i was just always around music and uh i don't know i think that i think he just wanted me to be around it all but he never actually pressured me to do anything as far as music it just kind of naturally happened like he was right. like, if anything, he'd be like, "Gosh, Sharon, stop! Shut up! Stop playing the drums! <laughs> you know, stop playing the silver chair songs on your on your bed! You know." <laughs> oh, like, silver chair! There we go. Now you're taking us back in a time machine, man. This is going right. back to some silver chair. Which, oddly enough, I see that. Uh, 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 the, 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 since you brought it up, uh, was silver chair a big influence for you? Like, were yeah. you into them? Yeah, dude. This it's my top five. I would say one of my top five favorite bands of all time. And Daniel Johns, I think, is back out there doing stuff now, isn't he? He's also got a brilliant podcast as well. Will there be a collaboration between one Jaron Johnston and one uh, uh, Daniel Johns? I, I I hate that flight. I've done it, but I would go right now. You know what I mean? I yeah. would do. I, I would. I would literally leave Columbus, Ohio, right now, and fly to Australia. Daniel Johns. Yeah. Called called me and said, "Hey." And I'd be like, fuck, yeah, let's go. And my wife would definitely go too because she's a huge fan. 
I, and you know, it's funny that you brought them up, man, because they kind of got swallowed up when that whole grunge alternative uh, scene was exploding. Um, uh, well, obviously, they didn't have a very, uh, very deep catalog, but they seem to be one of those bands that didn't really get the recognition uh, uh, th 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 that they should have because they were insanely young, if I remember. Weren't they very young when they put out that it, first album? Yeah. I mean, they 15. were kids. Yeah. The, the odd thing about that is, is him and I are the exact same age, a um, couple months apart, and he was 15 when they kind of broke out when Frog Stomp yeah. blew through the roof. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, you know, he's too young, too young. It took me, it took me 20 years of doing this shit to even get to where somebody recognizes me in a damn airport. So I can't yeah. imagine what that would be like, you know, and that's annoying. So yeah. I can't imagine what that was like at 15. So yeah, they, they, they blew up really quickly. And, um, and what they what they did their whole their whole you said something about catalog a minute ago their whole catalog is incredible and it goes everything from the beginning where you hear that simple um seattle chord progression all the way to the most technical beatles situations you've right, ever right. listened to and, and so it's it's a pretty brilliant situation and he's it, he's such an interesting cat man yeah you should check out his podcast it's it's pretty I will. wild absolutely yeah. i will yeah i appreciate the recommendation uh, yeah i will definitely check him out he seems like a very uh interesting guy it, it, now i don't want to draw dividing lines but if someone were to hold your f feet to the flames and really make you answer the question how do you identify yourself more and i'm not saying you can't be both but you feel more like rock guy or do you feel more like country guy i'm the everybody well at least in nashville the people i would say they classify me as the rock guy but um, but I grew up there and the three of us grew up there. So it's, you can't get much more. So anytime somebody says you're not country enough, we're like, well, shit, we're from here. Where are you from? You know what I mean? So right, it's right. like, that's true. Touché. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I did grow up, you know, my favorite band of, of all time is Raging Against the Machine. So it's like, Why you not? know, that fits so fair enough for whoever says that, but I'm like, okay, so is Sam Hunt country or right. Sam Hunt pop, Sam Hunt pop. Right. And they're like, well, Sam Hunt's from uh, Alabama. And I'm like, yeah, but listen to the music. Like, so that's what's cool, I think, about the damn genre in general is like, what you can call us what I want. We're still selling this fucker out tonight. Right, you know right, what I mean? Right. There's going to be country fans. There's going to be rock fans here. And it's all over the world that's happening. So it's like, I almost get like irritated with people, not you, obviously. I'm just saying, like, when they're like trying to classify us. I know. Because I'm like, know. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like we don't. Right. We don't try to put us that then. So why should you, you know what I mean? Like that's the, you know, you know, what is it about rage against the machine that makes them your favorite band? I know we talked about the political message or whatever, but uh, uh, like, what is it specifically that makes them your favorite band? Can you really put like a, a, a description to it or, or, or can you put it yeah. into words what it is that they do for you? It's the growing, growing up a drummer and, and love a heavy backbeat. There's not a yeah. band that does that better. You could argue that Chili Peppers do. Um, I will say between Zach, Zach's angst and uh, delivery vocally, and then Brad's heavy backbeat, and yeah. then you throw in. And of course, what Tom manages to do on a guitar, which he pretty much is able to play the guitar and DJ on it at the same time, which is pretty incredible. It's beautiful. It is beautiful, and it is heavy, and it is like, you know, the Ghost of Tom Joe, that cover. First time I heard that, I was like, holy shit. Yeah. I was like, yeah. that's how you do a cover. Yeah. That's how you do a yeah. cover. And yeah. so it's like when you when you listen to you know Tim Bob's bass too with I mean it's just all so thick and cool. And there's only four of them. And they say on the record, one thing that I was always mesmerized with it says all sounds made by Rage Against the Machine. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And even yep. when you think there's a DJ in there, some there's keyboards, gotta be keyboards. Rick Rubin's pulling a trick. No, sir. Yeah. It's those dudes making that music. And so I always thought Absolutely. that was something special to grab a hold of. So that, I mean, in a nutshell, that's, and also, dude, it comes down to the time in your life when you're the most influenced. And I was 12, 13 years old, and I heard that first record, and I was like, fuck yeah. yeah. I was like, okay, I don't Pretty know powerful. what this is. I don't know right. what he's mad about, but man, this is rad. You know, you right. know what I mean? It's, it's right. that kind of yeah. thing, that feeling. Well, 
and it's very and obviously they're a very polarizing band as far as like their views on things and you know i remember that that first album the cover art the guy on fire you know what i mean it, it all just kind of takes you by you know kind of takes you like by storm like wow i've got to see what this is all about you know what i mean like but i mean uh, I, do you think they made any any well, you know, I don't want to say missteps in their career, uh, you know, because obviously, you know, they've ended up where they've ended up for a reason. But but, but was it unfortunate that they just didn't kind of just carry on all the way? And if they had, where do you think that they would be right now? Obviously, they've reassembled for some shows here in the last couple of years. I don't know where they are as far as uh, the future of Rage Against the Machine. But, I mean, sh should they have been a huge, huge, huge band? I saw them in Chicago three and a half weeks ago, and it, I – I literally about pissed my pants and it's the yeah. first time I've seen them. I've seen that band more than I've seen any band. Yeah. And, um, I took my wife to see him and she was blown away. And those guys are older than I am. That band was destined to Im implode at some point because of all the angst and because of, you know, whatever the world brings, you know, and all that success and all that stuff. I, I mean, you know, it's kind of interesting that you said it because bands that we thought were bigger than life back in the day break up and now they come back together now and they're headlining Lollapalooza, whereas they I could know. not do that. You know what I mean? I it's know. like, wow. I know. So I told the guys, I made a joke there. I was like, maybe we should break up for a couple of years and get back together and then we'll <laughs> headline Coachella. Yeah, you got to create. Oh, Cadillac Three, Cadillac you, Three's back together. They're doing Madison Square Garden. You got to create like a mystique, <laughs> exactly right. Like people love like what was old once becomes new again. Yeah, I mean people love that. I think that's why uh, you know I think people still flock to see Kiss because you know they're milking this farewell tour for all it's worth. People keep thinking it's their last chance to see him. Meanwhile, every year they're buying tickets to see Kiss, thinking this is their last chance to see him. And you know who knows if there'll ever be a last chance to see him. I don't think the farewell tour is ever going to end. They're the Skinner. I know the, all the Skinner guys very well and the Motley Crue guys too. And they <laughs> literally, it's like, okay, so what is it? It's 2022. You started the We're Done tour in 2015. <laughs> what what are that. we doing? Maybe there's a trick to that. Maybe we just yeah. start telling people we're done. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm glad you brought up Motley Crue, though, and the fact that you're friends with them. Uh, but because obviously now, and it'll probably still be topical by the time I get your episode up on my page or whatever. But uh, when Motley Crue's out on the big stadium tour, because you had made mention about the correlation, and this is an interesting correlation, where, where Rage Against the Machine said all sounds made by Rage Against the Machine. Do you cut bands like Kiss or Vince Neil because they've had long careers? I've asked this about to other musicians too. Do you cut them some slack? when they use backing vocals and these tricks and stuff to enhance the show? Or do you think that the live experience ought to be an authentic live experience? Obviously Paul Stanley is getting slammed for, you know, for kiss using backing vocals, even though they're the ones who sang the vocals originally. Uh, Vince Neil is getting a lot of flack on the stadium tour, teleprompters, letting the crowd do a little too much singing. Uh, are, are they using tricks and bells and whistles behind the scenes? I, I, where do you stand on that? It's whatever makes it work, man, for, whatever band like it's different for everybody i mean obviously in the country western world here that we live in in the states it's you know it's all the bells and whistles man you know like yeah you, see, you see everything our, works and all yeah dude our, our thing is just you know it, it's whatever works for the artist like we try to keep our thing as organic as possible just because that's what we do and we honestly if you put us to a click with in ears and all that shit, man. I don't know that we we wouldn't we move, you know, like right. right. We all kind of move together, so it's a different kind of music. Like if you're up there playing one four five, you know, whatever big old country hit songs, it's a different thing. And if you're right. doing Motley Crue, well, you, you know the that that crowd's gonna want to hear, you know, they're gonna want to hear the effects and all that shit that's on those sure. records yeah whereas with us we can just get up there and play our shit even though it's a little different than the record sounds people are kind of expecting that so right. i think people would be kind of let down at least our fans if it was exactly like the record like that and that that's also boring to me too because you're letting something else do the work uh um, right 
Whereas that would probably be a lot easier on us. Yeah. Well, it's hard to replicate but, what you did 30 or 40 years ago, though, too, though. That's, un that's an unfair expectation to have of somebody to come out and hit notes that they hit, you know, a long time ago, uh, you know, in their younger days. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, I, you know, I think walking away from the show and getting the best experience ought to be, you know, especially when you're plopping down a lot of money. I mean, concert tickets are not cheap nowadays, you know, I mean. Yeah, that's why we started everything pretty much in drop D. That yeah, way. we gotta go down. <laughs> we gotta go down at some point. We can go to C sharp, I guess, but that's gonna be a pain in the ass for my guitar tech. Yeah. Now, twenty twenty was the last album we got. So, uh, is there new music on the horizon from you guys? And 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 when should we expect a a, a, a new uh, Cadillac three album? Um, I would say, to be honest with you, I don't know, but it'll definitely come sooner than later. We actually got a mix back yesterday. And it was it was not right, so we're going back to the drawing board on that one. But uh, hang on, I'm opening a beer here. Speaking no, of, go ahead. I don't. I love this kind of stuff. I love this kind of stuff with like, when it's all happening organically. I don't like. I said before, I don't edit shit, man. I just let it happen as it happens, man. I I I, I ramble on and on, and uh, when when you froze up and we're out of the room there, I just uh, keep on rambling. I'm the yeah, rambling. Say, I'm, I'm the rambling man, uh, to, to, as the Almond Brothers would say, just rambling on. Go. Um, yeah, I think we, you know, ideally first of the year, you know, um, yeah. of 2023, we, we originally kind of wanted it for October, but with everything that's happened this year, it's just been a kind of a fucking mess, you know? So, wait, and a lot of, you know, a lot of the new records going to be, you're going to hear about it too. I think yeah. there's going to be some songs that are based towards that. And then there's going to be some like, you know make myself feel better songs too right. you know what i mean so sure. It's, sure. It, i think I, if if anybody was asking i would say this is going to be heavy um in both ways probably some topically and then musically it's going to be pretty heavy so uh, now, but I'm very excited about it though and now you you had mentioned earlier that you took your wife to see rage against the machine and i'm always curious because i can i can get my wife to go to concerts with me but only you know, certain bands. Like I just went to see some thrash bands. She's not into that. So those, I got to find another partner to roll with me, either a friend or, or, you know, my cousin rolls to a lot of shows with me or whatever. Is your wife more country or more rock? Oh, rock. She honestly, my wife. Yeah. She doesn't listen to a lot of country. Let's just say that. <laughs> she's a rock. She's a, okay. So she's a, okay. So she's a rock chick now. Uh, uh, so, uh, and, and what was her take on the whole rage against the machine thing? Uh, did she enjoy the experience? On the way, you know, and it was like, I told her, I kind of warned her. I was like, I know you've been to a lot of shows and she's been with us all around the world. And yeah. You know, she's been watching me since I was, we've been together for 20, almost 21 years now. And she's seen heavy. And I was yeah. like, you have not seen a crowd move. I said, she, cause she always buys the tickets and gets it set up or whatever. Cause I'm not capable of anything other than talking <laughs> to you right now and drinking beer. But, um, you know, I'm the I same way, buddy. Don't worry about it. I'm lost without my wife too, man. Lost, lost. Yeah. I just make sure you, I said, make sure you get us um, seats that are not floor level, you know, make sure we're a row or two up, you know, just cause you've never seen a crowd boo. Yeah. Like this crowd's going to move when they kick yeah. in. Yeah. And she's like, Oh, whatever, whatever, whatever. You know, I was like, <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you, were, you. you've been warned. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, I've been in, I, you know, as a kid, I was in that crowd, man. You know, yeah. when, I, when I felt yeah. the crowd move like that and it was like, no fucking yeah. joke. It was like scary. I and, was watching and kids so, the other day at the thrash show and I'm just like, oh, I missed the days of being able to get in the mosh pit and stuff. But after a couple of back surgeries, when you're 50 years old, you know what I mean? It's just, uh, the days come to an end, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> let's, 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 let's get a suite, honey. Let's get a suite. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 there's certainly a desire to want to jump in the pit, but it's just, you know, you got to know like what your body can handle. I mean, I jump in that mosh pit and I'm probably in bed for the next week, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude. After every show, I have to get my little hemp icy hot thing and put nice. it all over me. And it's just, yeah, it is what it is. But, you know, and I, I keep telling everybody, I'm like, yeah, I'm about two weeks away from Mick Jagger throwing them damn New Balances on on stage. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so, uh, 
So uh, you you just made mention about you had just heard a mix and it wasn't right. Uh, um, who makes that decision? Is, is that also kind of a, a democratic process? Do you guys all sit down and listen to a mix and kind of look at each other and say that's that we're we, we're not feeling that? Yeah, we all. I mean, it's you know you kind of know the three of us are kind of one brain at this point, one brain with long hair. Yeah. For people out there who writes for people out there who write songs or are who are aspiring songwriters, when you yourself and and I, obviously I said at the top of the interview, you know, you've written certainly for some big heavyweights, you've been nominated for awards. So, you know, obviously um you know, you certainly know what you're talking about when it comes to songwriting. When you sit down you specifically, if you're going to write, is there a certain ambiance that you have to set? Do you have to be in a certain place, a certain mindset? Do you have a room in the house where you write? Like, you know, talk to me a little bit about like what your process is. You know, uh, do you have to have a couple of drinks, a little smoke? Like, what kind of gets you into the writing mode? No, man, I usually don't do any. Like, I don't, I don't enhance my thoughts really at all when I'm writing. I mean, it's usually just back. You can see this is the back of the bus here. This is my little studio. <laughs> Yeah, this is usually where we just write at the house. That's where the studio. magic happens. Yeah, yeah, I got a studio at the house downstairs, and you know, it's you know, it's different every time. Like I said, sometimes I'll be writing downtown Nashville. I have a room down there, and at Sony, and then sometimes it's here, sometimes it's at the house. But it's usually like you know, my my main thing. I heard a buddy of mine, Ben Queller, uh, it's a he lives in Austin. He used to live in New York, actually. Um, yep. But he kind of came up in the time of where, you know, Evan Dando kind of took him under his wing from the Lemonheads. Oh, yes. Moved to Brooklyn and kind of came out at the time that the strokes were hitting really hard. Mm -hmm. Like that whole, was it Williamsburg or Williamsburg? Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. Uh, and then Jet and, you know, uh, Kings of Leon. Yep. Came at that time. I heard him say one time on the bus, he came out, he comes out with us every now and then to write songs and. He said, man, I just, I feel like if you have to work too hard, that if you, you know, if, if it doesn't come to me immediately, I get away from it because you're forcing it. So right. I kind of keep that mentality of when I'm writing songs, be like, ah, because if you, if you start forcing it, you're going to end up in this one, four, five world where you're just like, ah, oh, right, right, like, right. What are we doing? What are we doing? This is not different. There's no reason for the world to have this. Right. You know right. Mean? Are you one of those guys who sits at a computer and writes, or are you all old school? Are you like with a pad and a pen? Like it, 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 it's both. I, I don't usually use the pad and pen because I don't write. <laughs> it just takes forever. Yeah, yeah. I'm, my brain moves way too quickly for that. Uh, a lot of my friends, Keith Urban, shows up every time with a damn uh, pen and a pad, and sometimes an old 808 uh, drum. Nice, nice. Kip Moore, same way. He shows up with a pen and a pad. Uh, but yeah, I kind of just. I usually just feed off what's going on in the room and uh, if it's a computer or whatever, I, cause I do all the tracks and shit like that. I can do all that stuff, but sometimes it just calls for an acoustic guitar and a couple people writing a song. Right. Sometimes it's a vibe. Sometimes, Hey, I got this thing. It's really cool. Check it out. You hit play and it's like, whatever. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, a lot of the Cadillac stuff kind of comes that way. Just me sitting back here making tracks and uh, I'll be like, Hey Neil, check this out. And I'll come back here and, I mean, we can have whoever's on the road with us. I'll be like, hey, come over the bus. Check this out. Let's write. You know, right. it's, it's different every time. I, I, now, as soon as you're done with a song, uh, or, you know, I, well, for, for first of all, how do you know when you're done with a song? And, 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 and what kind of a feeling comes over you? Uh, you know, like, I, I, I guess I'm trying to get inside the head of, of somebody uh, from a songwriter's aspect. Like, how, are, are you aware when you pen a song or, or get a song down on paper? I, I, obviously, you don't know how the audience or the, or the general public is going to respond to it, you know, but do you ever sometimes write something and like know like whether it's going to be like, uh, you know, a hit or not a hit? I mean, obviously, you're writing them all with the attentions of them all being hits, obviously, and, and, and being well received. But, you know, do you ever write a song and just get that vibe like, wow, like, you know, like I've just created something awesome here? Yeah. I mean, that happens, you know, that's a very special moment, you know? Yeah. Technically, you're, at least for me, you're never really done with a song until that son bitch is out. Right. You right. know what I mean? Like, you can tweak it, you can tweak all day long until it's actually on the radio or it's, you know, out in the world. Um, I remember Tom Douglas telling me they, they wrote House That Built Me, that Miranda Lambert song, Grammy song, 
won yep. every award you could win. Brilliant song. I think they worked on that thing for six years. Yeah. And it was never done. You know, they right. they turn it right. in, the publisher would be like, nah, it's not there yet. And like my publisher told me that like another one. <laughs> I spent six years on a song. <laughs> but but I, I tell you, it's you know, I think you I, I'm I'm pretty known for redoing a song like if if let's say a song is like just your normal standard country song i i'm pretty i i will take a song and redo it three or four five times in a different fill just to see yeah. if it explores a different world to where you know maybe it turns into a cadillac song maybe a cadillac song turns into a mcgraw song maybe right whatever you know like um, I, I also enjoy that too to see see taking a lyric that normally you would think would be a very simple country song and putting it over something else that could be something like rage, you know, or whatever. Right. right. Um, I think that's also why I've had the success that I've had is because I'm kind of not scared to get outside of those boundaries, you know. Yeah, that's important. That's definitely important. Um, so when you do sit down and write a song, though. Um, if it's if it's not specifically intended for an artist, do you ever write a song in in your head, like like kind of think like who uh, who it would be best suited for? Yeah, that happens just because of knowing all the guys and girls and yeah that are kind of getting the inside you know scoop on what they're looking for at the moment. Yeah. Um, I wrote Days of Gold pretty much all in my head on the way home. Yeah, and called me. I said, "Meet me at the house. I got something." And it was basically me putting um, those lyrics over. Oh, Black Betty, bam, bam. Oh, yeah, it's a yeah. uh, Ram Jam thing, and um, a White Lightning too. I wrote literally the whole song in my head on the way home, and I just went in and did it. But those were for us first. But then Jake really liked Jake Owen really liked the Days of Gold thing. Right. Um, and then some songs are like super like sculpted, like raise them up. I wrote those first two verses in my head on the way to the studio. And I happened to be writing with Tom Douglas and Jeffrey Steele that day. And then Tom comes in with the town's Van Zant crazy yeah. chorus, you know, and, and yeah. it was just, it was magic. So it's, I, you know, that's, it's hard to answer those questions. It's like, it's so different every time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, uh, you guys are you guys are out on the road road right now currently touring. Yeah, we're in Columbus, Ohio now. We'll be in I don't know somewhere tomorrow. We were in Detroit last night. And how are the shows going? Great. It's killer, man. It's yeah. it's it's bigger than it's ever been, and it's and there we haven't put out a record in a year and a half, so it's pretty wild. But also, you're dealing with aftermath of COVID, yeah. where we didn't get to tour those records. So yeah. I think that's you know a lot of people are really excited to get out and see us. Um, and we're super excited to see them. So it's good, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um. So, uh, when you guys get back into the studio, um, uh, first of all, do you like that process? Uh of the, of the recording process. Uh, you know, I always hear uh, musicians say, you know, they love the road, you know, some of them, and they hate the actual studio part of it. Do you enjoy the studio part of it? Or are you more of like a road guy? I love, I love both, man. I tell you, you know, I'm, I'm a producer too. So it's like, right. It's kind of my world, both, both. I'm a very lucky guy, man. A lot of people don't have that yeah. situation where they feel comfortable in a studio setting or in a live setting or in a writing room setting or, you know, a publisher setting or, you know, like we've got a lot of irons on the fire and it's, I, you know, when we, when the three of us get in the studio, man, it's, it's so fun because it's a different thing. We got right. family now coming in. We got Jude running around. Yeah, that's fun. Running that's around. Fun. Yeah, it, I know. It's such a cool thing, man. So uh, we we love it, and it's a chance for us just to get there and be creative and play, and not worry about anybody else looking at us. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely get what you say, man. Like about the uh, about the kids running around. I mean, me, me, you know, me and my wife 
very hands-on with our grandkids. There's always some combination of kids here. And and it gets exhausting, but yet it's still nice being young and being a grandparent, though, because I, I I feel like from the time that I could remember when I was born, my grandparents were just already really old. You know what I mean? Like now I feel like grandparents are a lot younger. You can kind of keep up a little bit more. I mean, my wife and I are 49 years old. You know what I mean? We, we, we can be more hands on with the grandkids. and But we, it, they still tire us out. But when they leave and they go home with their parents, which is nice, but uh, uh, that energy is gone. You know what I mean? It's nice yeah, to get rid of them sometimes, for sure. I'm, obviously, you know, we get tired too. But, you know, but then you look around at the toys that are all over the place and you just think, wow, the, you know, when that energy leaves, you know, it's, it's, you know, the house is quiet. We certainly like that, obviously. But, I mean. Well, you know, you're, you guys are very lucky. I don't even have any grandparents anymore. We are in a main line. I know. I know. Like all, all, all mine have passed away now, too. Yeah. I mean, all but my actual You know what I mean, though? That's that's crazy because, you know, we didn't have kids till later. And, you know. Right. But, so, it's like. And Jude's very lucky because, you know, he has uh, some of them <laughs> left. But um, it's, 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 yeah, I totally get what you're saying. Right. I never know if I should be bragging about being a young grandparent or if that makes me look like a shit parent because my kids were out there <laughs> procreating too young. <laughs> Who knows? You know what? You got to live in the 21st century, though. You know what? Your kids are going to go out and do what they're going to do. And you just try to point them in the right direction. It's the best you can do. You know, I mean, is, is that all you have is just the one little guy? Yeah, I got Jude, and Neil has uh, Lulu, and he just had a new one. Uh, her name is Teddy May. Nice, nice, nice. So the whole family goes out on the road too. Uh, well, I bring I bring my family out quite a bit. We'll take the family bus. Um, we're probably, I would imagine, we'll start doing that where we all kind of come together sometimes. Uh, yeah, and I guess Kilby will bring his cats and his dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, so me. Uh, obviously being uh, the offspring of David Lee Roth, uh, you know, I am more in the glam sleaze world. So uh, if, if if I can get a collaboration with one Jaron Johnston, how do I get a Grammy nominated song? I mean, write one for me, will you? Yeah. I, Share the wealth me, a little. You know, I will say, man, when, when I got your, because uh, it, we, it was on Instagram, I guess, right? I think so. That's, yeah. I, yeah, I reached, well, I reached out to you via Facebook Messenger, but I, I think it, it went to your Instagram account. Yeah, yeah, and so like I get, I wish you could see the messages. Hey, would really like to write a song with you one day. You know, I'm coming to Nashville. I'll be there tomorrow. Can you write a song <laughs> with me? And these are like strangers. These are people that I do not know. And Crazy. Like, like what the fuck, man? No, yeah. I mean, <laughs> dude. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad that you hit me though, because this is fun, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very tongue in cheek about the whole thing. I mean, but uh, uh, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, obviously, man, uh, uh, you know, being a front man though is, is an immense responsibility, though. I mean, you, you know, it's very tongue in cheek with the David Lee Roth stuff, but I mean, you know, you being the front man of the band, and I know, uh, you know, obviously, you know, you're in a band with family members or whatever. You know, you probably don't want to be pretentious to say, you know, I'm the leader of the band, so to speak, but. Being the face of the band, though, is there a lot of pressure, though? You, I mean, you, you know, you must probably you, you must be asked to do a lot of the press, a lot of these type of things. Uh, you know, th does it get daunting being the front guy? So sometimes do you wish maybe I'd have stayed with the fucking drums and been in the back? No, no? man, we split it up. Like, the yeah. thing about three of us is, like, it's a it's a unit, man. It's a team. Like, Neil will do yeah. three or four day. Yeah. Kelby will do three or four day. I'll do a couple, you know. they. Oh, that's good. Then. They make so it, you guys split them up. Yeah, they yeah, they make it pretty easy on on me. We we all try to, and that's a good thing about keeping a band together too, is you split up the work, you know. Yeah, well, I can de I can definitely tell you, uh, uh, you know, obviously myself being the offspring of David Lee Roth, that uh, you know, if I may be so bold as to give you a couple of tips, work on your flexibility and your karate kicks. That's a big part of Dave's show. You know, what I mean, I think throw more kicks on stage. There's never there always room for more kicks. I'm working on it. It's this. It's those boots, those damn Saint Laurent's. It's hard to get them up in the air. And I don't know if you're using enough hairspray either, man. Uh, you know, if you haven't invested in this stuff yet, Aquanet. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you could probably blame a lot of the holes in the ozone layer in, in, in uh, the 1980s in general. I think this probably created a lot of the problems right here. But you know, this is product placement right here. I'm hoping to get them as a sponsor someday. But um. Obviously, you need more hairspray. I, I just made some notes. I don't want to critique you too much. Uh, probably wear a little more neon. You got anything in neon pink or like lime green? I, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go shopping at H and M here in 
about 20 minutes. Work so. on it. Work <laughs> on it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously, I think your drug and booze intake is probably right where it should be. And then, obviously, take a look right there. You got to have the smoldering look. You got the smoldering front man look. Yeah, there you go. There you go. It's that That's smoldering. You know, you got to melt the women's heart. It's not about the guys. The guys are going to go wherever the chicks go, right? That's exactly right, man. You try to that's do that with every song. You try you to do that with that's you, you, not, you just explained hit songwriting in a perfect sentence. Get get the guys, and then get the girls. Get the girls. Get the guys. So yeah. it's like it's a lyric. Eric Church does it really good. I like mustard on my fly, my fries. I like football, but I love your love the most. You right, know what I mean? Right, like, right, 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 that's right. How you do I, it. I, 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 Spoken like a guy who's who's been in a long term relationship for a long time. I I, I myself just passed uh, twenty four years of marriage. You got to figure it out eventually, man. They know what's best. You know what I mean? They do. Yeah. What it is, man. You got to keep it together, man. Right. Well, listen, man. It's been a blast talking to you, man. I really appreciate you being so generous with your time. You know, I love the fact that we walked around the bus. I love the fact that you were frozen. I love the fact that there were some fuck ups and some hiccups along the way. It's all part of the process. It's 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 life happening right here. No need to edit any of it, right? Fuck it. I love it, man. Hey, we need to get together next time we're at, you're in New York, yeah? I'm in upstate New York, man. The asshole and or armpit of the United States. Yes. Whichever we're way you want to look quite at. a bit, man. Are you guys yeah. up here quite a we're, bit? Yeah, man. We do like Rochester, Syracuse, Jordan, all those places. Yeah, yeah. I'm closest. Long, long, uh, 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 Geography-wise, I'm closest uh, probably to the cities you named. I'm closest to Syracuse. That's about f uh, 30, 40 minutes away. So that, that, that's the closest, yeah. uh, you know, big city to me. Okay. Well, hit me up anytime. I'll send you, my, I'll send you yeah. my info on the Instagram thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. On Facebook Messenger, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, yeah, we'll stay in touch, and uh, hopefully, we can get up and, uh, you know, we we could definitely do this again. I feel like we're some kindred spirits here. You know, what I mean, two guys that, uh, you know, two guys with uh, long blonde hair and uh, strikingly handsome and good women standing next to him. Although I could take both, my hair off. And both related to David Lee Roth. And both related to David Lee. Roth. Oh, are you making the claim too now? Wait a minute now. I don't want to slice up the pie too much here now. If I'm going for a piece of Dave's wealth. And you're going for a piece of Dave's wealth. You I obviously know. didn't do your you didn't do your homework too good because you didn't no. know I was related to. <laughs> oh man, it's finally nice to meet you, brother. I knew we'd find each other somewhere along the road. <laughs> I knew. I, I saw. I saw a resemblance. It was nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, man. I, I wish you all the best of luck, man, with the rest of the tour. We'll definitely stay in touch, man. Um, uh, it's been a blast talking to you, man. And uh, you can't wait for the new record, man. And in the meantime. I'll be blessed in the uh, I'll be blessed in the shit that I currently have right now. I mean, what awesome, else can man. I do? So I'll, send you, I'll send you new music as soon as I got it. Hurry the fuck up, will you? Jesus Christ, we're waiting here. Who do you think you are? I mean, five, six, seven years between albums. How long is it going to be, man? Cadillac Three fans are waiting. Working on it. We're gonna love. It. I know you Jeez. are. I know you are, man. And God damn it, I'm going to write a strongly worded letter to the fucking Grammy people and tell them what the fuck's the hold up here, man. Maybe I'll make you a Grammy. Maybe I'll maybe That's I'll good. make you a Grammy. I'll whittle it out of wood for you. Bring it. I like you deserve it. it, man. You deserve it. Listen, man. You're penning great songs. You're doing everything you should be doing, man. Keep it up, man. I love you to death, Thank brother. You, love yeah. you, man. Take care, bud. All Thanks. right, man. Nice talking to you, brother. Take it easy. There he goes, right there, man. The great, the legendary Jaron Johnston from the Cadillac Three. There are three X's in Rex Ruger. There are three in the Cadillac Three. Count them. Hope you guys enjoyed that. That is Jaron Johnston, singer, songwriter, guitarist. He's written for, let me run down his accolades here. He's written for Keith Urban. He's written for Tim McGraw. He's done it all. He's 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 out there. Big time player right there, man. And he also has his own little band called the Cadillac Three. And if you don't know them, you should be punched in the face and uh, thrown down a flight of fucking stairs. I don't know what else to tell you. There were hiccups in that interview. Uh he was frozen. He he left. He came back in. He walked around the bus. He was pixelated. Who the fuck cares? This is real life happening, unfolding. This is why there's no frills on this podcast. And so I hope you guys enjoyed that. That is Jaron Johnston of the Cadillac 3. Their last album was 2020's Tabasco and Sweet Tea. If you ain't checked that one out, boy, you're missing something. Go do it. If, you're, if they're coming to a city near you, go check them out. See them in the live venues. Go out and buy their merch. Support them and everything that they do. And remember to take it easy and keep it sleazy.